Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran trying to remember the password to your 2005 Reverb Nation account, or else a scrappy upstart, trying to remember the password to your Four Loco Influencer account, this is your show because ultimately it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the third Friday of January 2021, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Daniel, who drove a Nissan Xterra with Mortal Kombat decals on the back window, and who would always try to sell you clonopin pills that he crushed up and sold in big league chew bags. And old Daniel would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in like six months. But it's the future now. You guys, that's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. Everything that you need for a professional website is already built in. Hosting in a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates. You could sell your merch commission-free there. They have mailing list tools to grow your fan list. They have social media integrations. It's a wonderful product. Listeners to the Working Songwriter Podcast can go to banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Simply use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Uh, If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, every Sunday night, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I am over on YouTube for Sunday Songs. It is a weekly live stream. I'm live. I'm live streaming, I'm playing tunes, answering questions, taking requests from the live chat. It's a really fun and interactive experience. I dare say that we're building something of a community over there uh, in the live chat and otherwise, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of that community over there every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Sunday Songs. If you have any trouble finding it, just go to joepugmusic.com and click on live stream. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter or search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you don't have to pay, but that you choose to pay because you dig the show and you won't miss a couple bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thanks to everybody who's Uh, done that already. If you're not in a place where you can kick in in that way, I totally get that. I've been there myself. There's still a couple ways that you could help for free. First, uh, you could leave us a review in the iTunes store. Give us a five-star review, say that we're doing a good job. Or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. So that's all the harassment I have for you Uh, Today, I hope you enjoy this week's conversation. Our guest this month hails from Michigan, but has become a fixture of the singer-songwriter scene in St. Louis. Beth Bambara 
went to college to study music and culture, and her creative work took an auspicious turn when she was paired with her future husband and musical collaborator, Kit Harmon, at the Contemporary Music Center on Martha's Vineyard. The pair moved to St. Louis, where they broke into the music scene by becoming integral members of the open mic at the legendary club Off-Broadway on the city's south side that abuts the Mississippi River. She spent some time touring in the band of Samantha Crane, an alumni of our podcast here, but ultimately decided to follow her own star and establish herself as an artist to be reckoned with. The St. Louis Riverfront Times has recognized her on several occasions as the city's best singer-songwriter. The Columbia Daily Tribune says that she crafts modern spirituals. Pop Matters says that she delivers her songs with wisdom and a sense of purposeful reservation. And No Depression says of her, getting it done and making great art is what this artist has been up to lately. I met Beth a few years back playing a show together and have remained a fan of her music ever since. We had a chance to catch up on the phone this week and I got a chance to hear about her journey so far. Beth Bambara, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. You grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Tell me about uh, what life was like and and what part of your life music uh, was in as a kid. Yeah, so Grand Rapids, um, man, I feel like uh, growing up there was, I had a a good experience growing up there. I feel like I grew up in a pretty safe, nurturing environment, um, which looking back on that now, I'm pretty grateful for. But um, I would say like I didn't I didn't grow up in a super big musical family per se. But, um, you know, we had a piano in the house and um, at at some point uh, my mom had a guitar. There was a guitar laying around. And so I kind of just was my curiosity was piqued by that and so um i think when i was maybe 12 or 13 i i picked up the guitar and i said hey mom can you teach me how to play this and and her response to that was she just gave me like a a book of guitar chords (laughs) and then i you know went in the basement and kind of started to figure it out for myself and um i found i i enjoyed the guitar much more than the piano. Um, but I think that was because, you know, I had taken some formal lessons on the piano and, um, I'm, I was kind of gravitating towards just listening to songs on the radio and, and figuring out how to play them rather than, you know, reading music off of a page. So it, it, music for me became, it was more of an emotional experience rather than, you know, learning all these technical things. I had, what you just described right there, I had almost exactly the same experience, especially with guitar, just getting like a Mel Bay chord book. And I think when I'm you're, pretty sure that's the book that it was. Of yeah. course it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they yeah, only made yeah. one. And, uh, but yeah, I, I had a similar experience in that anything that I had done, um, you know, formally with music, I think I was in the school band playing saxophone or something. I had no interest mm-hmm. in that whatsoever. But when I could be by myself with a book like that, kind of autodidactic, um, it felt like a mm-hmm. discovery when you would put your fingers in that position and and play the chord, you know, and it was very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's some sort of organic kind of magic to it that way. Um, and yeah, that so that was kind of my experience there. There also at some point I have I have two younger brothers, and so they kind of got into their own, you know, sort of musical discoveries, and, and my, one of my brothers decided he wanted to play drums, so then a drum set showed up in the house, and then I kind of was like, oh, what's this? This is really fun. I can just hit things, so I kind of uh, learned how to play the drums a little bit, and um, then, you know, you mentioned school band. Um, I decided I don't know I just had this attitude where I was like I don't want to do what everybody else is doing but band sounds like fun so I found out there wasn't a trombonist in the band and I thought 
well, I'm going to do that because nobody else is doing it. <laughs> and so I, ta- I taught myself how to play trombone. Um, you know, I wasn't great at it, but I, I could hang with, you know, what was going on. So That's great. That remi- this is a very random story, but it reminds me of a friend of mine that when we were all joining the school band in middle school, he was absent the day that everyone got to choose an instrument. So when he got back, the only thing that was left was French horn, and he was so pissed. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, so yeah. you, when did you decide, um, hey, you know, I, I, I can not only play a few chords on this guitar, but maybe I don't have to play someone else's song, someone's song that I'm hearing on the radio. Maybe I could write a song or two on my own. Yeah, I think um, when you're talking about kind of feeling like you've discovered something on your own, um, I did have like early on experience of just like hearing these melodies in my head. And so then I would try to figure out, you know, well, what, what chords can I play that work with these melodies? Um, but I don't think I actually really wrote a song, like a, what I would consider a completed song idea until, um, I had met, uh, this group of, uh, really e- excited, enthusiastic girls in school, and um, they they were like hell bent on starting a band. And uh, they heard that I played guitar, or you know, could play a couple chords. <laughs> right. And um, they kind of convinced me to join their ranks, of which nothing actually existed yet. <laughs> so right. Right. when we fir- first got together. Uh, um, they pulled out a stack of lyrics that they'd already written. Um, so then, you know, my first experience with really songwriting was coming up with chords and melodies for the, these lyrics that already kind of existed. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. That, that's kind of an interesting way in. Yeah, it, it was, it th- I mean, it was just kind of like, well, this is the group of people we have. And so uh, I kind of had that skill a little bit already I mean just literally just in my head in my bedroom I had been you know kind of concocting melodies and figuring out what what chords fit with them but this actually gave me like lyrics to work with so it was more of like uh fitting these puzzle pieces together in in a way starting a band at that age is such heady stuff like you you, I'm serious like at some point you just have this realization of like well we can do it we can practice in so-and-so's garage and and we could put together some flyers for a show that we'll do at the at the community center next week you know what I mean like it's very empowering yeah no it was I mean it, it actually was an amazing experience for me because I I honestly I was really shy in school and and I I just I liked to just kind of be in the background and so like all I wanted to do was just play play an instrument in a band you know I didn't really I loved the collaborative nature of it like you know playing with other people having that collective experience of making something out of nothing and then you know it wasn't too long after that then we were like hopping in a van and driving to the next city and then you hear a room full of kids singing along to your song it's like holy crap this is this is really cool yeah that's what i I think that's probably what heroin feels like i'm not quite sure but (laughs) i think it's got to be something like that so you guys were like kind of regionally touring a little bit it sounds like yeah yeah i mean it's funny because i was i mean i was I couldn't, I wasn't old enough to go into bars. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we'd, we'd play really like you were talking about, like community centers, basements, basement shows, coffee shops. Um, and when we, we did start getting gigs in bars and, um, (laughs) like they, they didn't want me to stay in the bar after we played. Uh, sometimes I'd have to just go wait in the van or, you know, occasionally they'd let me stay in the bar, but I'd have to sit right in front of the bartender so they could be like watching me all the time right right or big big x's <laughs> on the hands or something like that right yeah yeah and i was the youngest one in the band so there was a point where you know i was the only one who had the x's on my hands and um 
But because I was the youngest one in the band, uh, when we kind of got together and started putting putting these songs together um, and actually forming formulating a set, uh, the question was, well, who's going to sing these? And uh, I kind of got bullied into it because nobody else wanted to do it. Mm. And I said, well, I... They, they were like, okay, you're the, you're the youngest. We're going to make you do it. And I was like, I don't know, guys. I don't know if I... I don't really want to be the singer. I just want to play guitar. But, you know, also I was writing the melodies and putting these the melodies and the lyrics together. So it, on one hand, it kind of made sense. So, What do you think that did for you? You mentioned kind of being some something of a wallflower. Um, and so what do you think that that did for you being forced into that role? Yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely made me kind of open up a little bit and to realize that there's not a whole lot to be afraid of <laughs> getting up in front of people. And, um, you know, I, at, at first I had to like really just zone out and just get in my happy place and close my eyes and, you know, kind of disappear in that way. And then that's how I kind of became comfortable. But then, you know, there's this magic that happens when you're on a stage and, and you have the audience kind of giving you feedback and when they're smiling and they're like uh singing along you know it's it's really that kind of all of that energy helped me to kind of like feel like I could do this yeah yeah that's the type of feeling that's a dragon you could chase for the rest of your life because it's a really good it's a really good feeling and well it's a good thing that you uh that you uh got thrust in that role under uh, 21 and under drinking age because you just had to sit in that <laughs> feeling and do it rather than get blackout drunk before a show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it really it really did start to pull me out of my shell a little bit. And I mean, I, I still experience uh, stage nerves, definitely, um, sometimes more than others, but it, it's gotten so much better. For sure. I, I feel you, not to jump too much ahead here, but this is something that we actually don't talk about too much on this show. So I'd love to dig into it. Um, I still get uh, stage nerves um, at this point in my life. And I've been playing for 20 years. Um, I have a couple techniques to deal with it. But do you have techniques to deal with that? Or do you, do you just plow through? I mean, uh, I feel like I always have to come when I get too outside of myself and then I start over analyzing what I'm doing. You know, if I flub a chord or my voice gets a little shaky, it's like uh, I have to direct myself back to the song itself. So just focusing on that song and, and taking a little extra breath usually helps me. If I can get into that, I can kind of refocus and then everything's okay. So I got you. A couple of years ago, about four or five years ago, I decided to stop drinking before shows. And that was really mm. hard for like the first six months, I would say. But then after that, um, it it um, it gave me a lot of confidence then to to feel like I didn't need a crutch before I got on stage. Sure, yeah, that's that's real good. That's yeah, I commend you on that. Um, uh, well, I I just had to do it because there's so many damn words in my songs that I would get drunk <laughs> and just start forgetting them. So it's just if I wanted I mean, to, I mean, I can. I can relate to that, yeah. <laughs> so after you have this project, uh, kind of sounds like from high school and into early adulthood, um, you actually mm -hmm. go to college for uh, uh, creative work and, and for music. Is that what you were mm -hmm. studying in school? And, and what did you learn at that point in your, your education? Yeah, it, it was. I mean, and I kind of approached school as like, well, what do I want to learn about? Not like, well... I, what am I going to do to get a job when I graduate? <laughs> yeah. And so I, w I was just kind of following my interests. And um, I was able to, you know, take take some studio recording classes to kind of get familiar with how to how to work in the studio. And that that has proved to be very helpful. Um, and but but really, I mean, going back to the collaborative experience, like learning how to work with other musicians on projects in in the studio and um all of that stuff it was very helpful but i'm also convinced that you can learn that stuff outside of a 
schooling environment. So it's just, I had decided that I wanted to take that sort of focused approach to it. Um, and I met so many people because of that experience that, you know, I wouldn't have come into contact with if it weren't for that. So, um, I think it was, it was worth it for me, but what are some things in particular that you learned at school, like about the studio that would help you going forward to, to craft your records? Mm, I mean, one big thing is just how to, uh, how to run a session. Uh, cause that was part of like our final exam was we had to actually bring a band in and record a couple songs. And that was like our final. So we actually had to figure out, you know, well, what's what's a good workflow in the studio? You know, are you going to track things, uh, track instruments separately? Are you going to bring in the band and, you know, track the drums and the bass at the same time? You know, what's in just learning that those are the options and there's different ways you can approach it. Um, so, yeah, learning things like that, kind of just how to navigate uh, in the studio, um, learning about different microphones and, you know, how to, that, that you can use the same microphone and get different sounds out of it by placing it differently. Um, learning all of those little things has been very helpful. Yeah. I, I really, I like it the most when songwriters do have some command of the medium of recording because it's, Everyone can have this beautiful sound in their head, but if you have literally no idea of how to achieve it, it's well, it's not worth a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And so just, just having those, and it's not, I mean, there's a whole world of uh, studio and recording to, to explore, but like just having some of those basic elements in your, in your arsenal can be really helpful, can help you realize a vision that you might have. Indeed. So you move on from there. And I guess a pivotal point in, in your life is when you meet your future collaborator and and husband at the Contemporary Music Center um, in, uh, was it Martha's Vineyard? Can you talk about that experience and, and how that changed the track yeah. in your life? Yeah. So that was uh, just a program in in school that I ended up in because I was, you know, again, just following what I was interested in. And so it was, you know, you got to just focus on songwriting and recording and working in the studio for like one whole semester. And so um, I was in a studio class and we we got assigned other um, other students got assigned to be our engineers. So I was an engineer, but then I got assigned to somebody and then somebody got assigned to me to be my engineer. Yeah. Uh, to do all of our recording for the semester. And so uh, that I got assigned to be Kit's engineer and he somehow got assigned to be my engineer. And so that's kind of how we met in this like first sort of creative working relationship. And I remember going into our first session and I don't know what we were, we were talking about, you know, what's, what song we were going to start working on or whatever. But I just remember, this is terrible and amazing thinking back on it. But I was like, I don't know, this, this guy's kind of an asshole. Like, <laughs> I don't know, if, I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah. But um, once we actually kind of got to know each other a little bit, um, first off, we realized we have extremely different creative approaches but um kind of once we figured out how to utilize those um for the greater creative good um and we're still figuring that out honestly what are Um, those two different approaches in the broad strokes so um i guess a good well there's two ways two different kind of ideas that i could Uh, Okay, so if you're just talking about songwriting, um, to me, when I think of a song, uh, I think, okay, you have lyrics and you have a melody and you have the chord progression. And to me, like, that's what a basic song is. Um, And so, but for, for him, he sees it as like the fully produced 
thing. So um, when he's hearing a lyric line or a melody, he's like hearing everything else that will go with it. So I, I kind of call that like he has a producer brain. Hmm. So whereas I'm more focused on like what's the specific melody and he's thinking about, okay, well, you know, that melody might change if the drum beat changes or, you know, if the bass line changes. And so it's, it's more of a, yeah, I, I call it more of a producer approach, um, which I don't, I'm learning to kind of see things that way a, a little bit more. Yes. But um, yeah, so that's one, that's one sort of, if you're talking about just the creative process, that's definitely... Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about kind of the marriage of form and content. Like you kind of bring you bring the content of the song, that being like the specific lyrics, the specific melody, uh, and he's kind of bringing how it will be formed into something that is uh, whole and uh, attractive in a way. You know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, that actually has been a, a very um, helpful thing to have. So normally yeah that's exactly what happens is i'll bring like i'll bring a skeleton of a song idea we'll have chords and melody and some lyrics and then uh then he'll kind of like start co-writing with me but like what he's doing is kind of fully producing the song so so that relationship has worked out um very beneficially for both of us I, I can see that and I can hear that in your records. I, I think one of the big mistakes that I made early on in my creative career was focusing so intently on the content um, and focusing it on it in a way as to think, well, the lyrics and the melody, I'm going to make this so good that the form isn't really going to matter. And kind of in the same way, I don't know if you've been to barbecue places, but a lot of barbecue places will think our meat is going to be so good that we're purposely going to make our sides really shitty and just prove that people will still come here for the meat, you know? But (laughs) I think that was a real mistake on my part early on uh, to not pay attention to that form and to not just try to completely muscle through with the content of the song to make something great, because I think you do need both parts. Yeah. That's that's a really good way to put it, and I think that's very true. Um, yeah, so it's it's been, and like I said, it, this uh, kind of creative collaboration is something that we've still, like, we're still learning how to work, work better with each other um, and learning from each other, and that's been a really positive thing. So, for example, what is one one aspect that you guys have learned to work better on to, to marry those two different approaches? What, what's something specifically that you've learned that one of you said to the other one, okay, I got your point. We don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't know if this specifically answers your question, but um, I, I think a big part of it for us is just learning how to uh, communicate more efficiently. So, um, uh, like with, with arranging or anything, it's, it's just like using specific words. Um, I've realized like doesn't actually communicate what I'm trying to communicate. And so, uh, that's, that's one thing I'm trying to think of a specific Like what example. would you be saying, thinking that you were communicating and, but you really weren't? Well, so, uh, one, one thing is it, this has happened a handful of times where kit is like you know maybe we just need to change change something like change uh change the rhythm or something and and to me i'm interpreting that as like we have to scrap the whole song this isn't good you know let's go back to the drawing board but really he's he's talking about making like a very simple change and so it's like sometimes that idea of like um a production idea just I'm, I'm seeing that as like, oh, this isn't working. We got to scrap the whole thing and start over. And, and really, no, that's not it. It's just like, how can we push this in a slightly different direction by maybe just uh, instead of straight strumming the chords, you just uh, go to an arpeggiated picking pattern or something like that. And that, you know, would lighten the song up. So uh, I'm I'm getting better, I think, at, at trying to realize... Um, 
what that means. <laughs> You heard Beth talking about her years starting out playing music, and as always with most creative paths, it's never a predictable straight line. First, she's going to college near home, then she's off to Martha's Vineyard, meeting a creative partner. Next, she's crashing on Samantha Crane's parents' couch in Oklahoma. Finally, she lands in St. Louis, a town that she had no particular attachment to before picking up and moving there. The creative life is like that. You pick up and you move to the next gig, the next city, the next session, the next collaboration. All of that with absolutely no promise of a successful or profitable outcome. There's a lovely poem by Frank O'Hara that speaks to the feeling of moving through life like that quickly, determined, attentive, almost reckless, and also wistful. It's entitled, How to Get There. White the October air, no snow, easy to breathe. Beneath the sky lies, lies everywhere, writhing and gasping, clutching and tangling. It is not easy to breathe, lies building their tendrils into dim figures who disappear down corridors in west side apartments, into childhood's proof of being wanted, not abandoned, kidnapped, betrayal staving off loneliness. I see the fog lunge in and hide it. Where are you? Here I am on the sidewalk, under the moonlight lamplight, thinking how precious moss is, so unique and greenly crushable if you can find it on the north side of the tree where the fog binds you and then, tearing apart into soft white lies, spreads its disease through the primal night of an everlasting winter which nevertheless has heat in tubes. West side and east side, and its intricate individual pathways of white accompanied by the ringing of telephone bells, beside which someone sits in silence denying their own number, never given out. Nameless like the sound of troika bells rushing past suffering in the first storm, it is snowing now. It is already too late, the snow will go away, but nobody will be there. Police cordons for lying political dignitaries ringing to, the world becomes a jangle from the index finger to the vast empty houses filled with people. Their echoes of lies and the tendrils of fog trailing softly around their throats. Now the phone can be answered, nobody calling. Only an echo. All can confess to be home and waiting. All is the same and we drift into the clear sky enthralled by our disappointment. Never to be alone again, never to be loved, sailing through space. Didn't I have you once for myself, west side, for a couple of hours? But I am not that person. So, obviously, you are now and have been for a while in St. Louis. You're, You're a fixture of the music scene there. Before you ended up there, though, uh, am I right that you moved to Oklahoma to tour in our mutual friend Sam Crane's band for a while? Can you talk about that period of your life? Yeah, I did. So this was um, a period where I had finished school, and it's kind of like, I mean, I definitely had that kind of oh shit moment where I was like, well, what now? What's next? And I, I felt like I needed to take a breather. I wasn't ready to, um, I wasn't to the point of really starting my own project yet and putting myself out there. And um, I had met Samantha and she, she had decided she was, I think this was the point in her life where she decided she was dropping out of school to just tour. And so she's like, hey, you want to come tour with me? And I said, okay, that sounds great. (laughs) <laughs> I can just come along for the ride. So I uh, packed up my 1990 Chevy Lumina and I drove from Grand Rapids, Michigan, all the way to uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma, and um, kind of planted myself there uh, with Sam. And uh, she she booked the tours 
via MySpace <laughs> back in the day. And um, we just we just kind of went all over. And I did that for about a year. That's quite the leap of faith. What, what did you learn uh, from working with her? And what did you learn from your first, that sounds like your first really extensive touring that you had done. Yes. Yeah, that, that was definitely, I hadn't done um, touring to that extent until that that point and so that's kind of like i i knew it would be a good experience i knew i would be in these new situations i'd never been in i um knew i would like learn what actually is involved in it in a bigger sort of touring mindset like that and um so i yeah i gained a lot of insight on kind of how do you self-book a tour how do you what are the logistics of actually making it happen how like getting experience of performing like every night in in front of people um i really it was it was a real growth experience for me performing every night in front of people especially when you're doing like a lower level tour where you're going to clubs you're driving yourself you're selling the merch you're packing Mm -hmm. everything up like it is grueling I, i don't think i realized how grueling it was until I got a little bit older and got off the road a little bit. But looking back now, I, I think about some of the tours that I did that were probably very similar to the one that you're talking about there. And it's um, there's not enough money or adulation in the world that could make me try to do that again. It's just, it's so hard. Oh, I, I agree with you 100%. And yeah, looking back on it, it's like, well, that's what I had to do to get to this place now. But, um, you know, certainly I was young enough that I could... I could sleep on floors every night if I had to, and no big deal. I know. I mean, in the, in the new age of coronavirus where we're, we don't uh, interact with people in any way, it, it's kind of amazing to think back that at that time we were both doing tours where you would just roll into a city, you play a gig, and from the stage to like the 25 to 50 people that were there, you would just say, uh, merch is in the back, and by the way, we need somewhere to crash tonight. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, totally. That would ha- that would happen. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's just it's just so funny to to look back on it like that. Uh, absolutely. I remember my friends but, um, in, in that band from uh, Portland Horse Feathers, they came through Chicago when I was, you know, 24 years old and I was like first of 3 or first of 4 and they ended up crashing at my house. It wasn't even my house. I was just renting a room there among other renters. And looking back, I'm like <laughs> We didn't know each other before that day. They had, and they ended up staying at my house that night. I mean, it's it, it's it's fun to think about, oh, and it's yeah. also horrifying at the same time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do have really great experiences um, of meeting musicians for the first time, and this is this is talking from a place when when I haven't been on the road, and I've been at home in St. Louis. Um, I Kit and I have a house in St. Louis, and one big thing we wanted when we uh, got the house was we want space for bands to be able to come crash with us. Mm -hmm. And so I remember like the first, first few years um, we, it was like constant, like people were coming in and out all the time. And um, I remember one, one day I got a, an email from a friend and they're like, yeah, I, I have some friends who are coming through town. They don't have a show, but they just need a place to crash for the night. And he sends me this, this link and he's like, yeah, they just like, they just played on Letterman or something. And I was like, what? So I go to look at, at it and it was the low anthem. And, uh, so I was like, well, yeah, I mean, if they, if they want to stay, you know, and he's like, oh, yeah, and they're looking for a good barbecue place. So I was like, okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I just remember this extremely awkward, like, I gave them my phone number and my address, and they showed up, and and they came in the house, and we just kind of stood, stood in the living room just, like, silent for, like, 30 seconds, because, like, we don't know each other. <laughs> right. And And then, and then all of a sudden, like, we just started talking and, and it turned out to be one of the most fun, uh, random times like that. Um, because our living room is basically our studio. So there's instruments everywhere. So it's like 
we kind of settled in and then they just started picking up instruments and jamming and it was like it was so much fun oh man i i I love that band and and particularly at that time when they were just getting started with that album uh oh my god charlie darwin uh there was there was this thing going on with them did you ever end up seeing them live i know they didn't play in st louis that time but did did you ever? yeah we did yep yep yeah um, a couple times. I mean, I, I loved, um, there was a trio that they had when Jossie Adams was still in the band and it was, uh, um, Jeff and Ben and, uh, man, they played some shows that just, and, uh, you know who else was in the band at that time was, um, Matt from the band Twain, currently of the band. Twain. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, yeah. he was playing with them too. And uh, man, I saw them at the nine thirty club a couple times and it was just, um, earth shattering, man. They were such a great band. Yeah. 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 So it it was, I mean, what a way to meet a band for the first time. (laughs) I know. So, Well, uh, and and you have so much in common. Like, even if you've never met a band like that, like you've probably been in the same position that they were, uh, you know, silently in somebody's front room for 30 seconds before instruments get uh, picked up. And, and, you know, (laughs) so, so you have a common language that you can speak. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, how did you end up, you know, so you're, you're touring with Sam, you're, you're kind of learning the ropes. When did you decide it was time for you to step out on your own and how did you effectuate that? Well, um, I think I, yeah, after, after playing a lot with, with Sam, I mean, that was a great experience and I kind of got to a point where, you know, when we weren't, um, when we weren't on the road, I was literally like sleeping on her parents' couch. Um, and so I got to a point where I was like, you know, I, I've been sleeping on couches a lot the last few years of my life. And, um, I think maybe I'm, I'm ready to like have my own space. Yeah. Red flag. (laughs) And, um, so, (laughs) yeah. So I just kind of felt like it was, it was time for me to do something new. And so, um, uh, Kit at the time had recently moved to St. Louis and we were dating and, um, uh, I figured, well, if, if I'm going to find out if this relationship is really going somewhere, you know, it, it might be helpful to be in the same city, you know? So, um, so I decided at that point to move to St. Louis and, um, Pretty quickly after I moved, I started meeting other musicians and um, actually joined a couple other bands. <laughs> and still, I still was on the the side woman train. You know, I I really enjoyed that. It there wasn't a whole lot of um, pressure of being a front person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I I um, was actually in a couple bands for a while before I started my own thing. But um, yeah, so that those bands would go out and play a lot. I feel like, I mean, I had shows, multiple shows a week uh, in town and out of town. And um, so Kit also was in a band and uh, that, that traveled quite a bit for a little while. And there would be points where we'd both, so we we're, yeah, we we're living in the same city, but also still traveling quite a bit. Um, but there was one time I remember, uh, I had a show in Chicago, so I was up in Chicago and then, uh, he had also been on the road for a few weeks. And then I re we both realized we were like, holy crap, we're playing in Chicago the same night. So <laughs> I remember after my gig in Chicago, I, I made it down to Shuba's where his show had just gotten done. And so we were able to like hang out at Shuba's for like 40 minutes before our bands had to like right. part ways again. <laughs> so, uh, that, but how did you know, um, did you know in a moment or was it a process to figure out that, you know, playing in other folks bands wasn't as much as you might've enjoyed it and learned things from it. It wasn't for you. What you needed to do was uh, uh, steer your own ship, be the captain of your own ship. Uh, how did that decision-making process play out for you? Yeah, so I think, um, and I and I certainly, yeah, I enjoyed 
I enjoyed my time playing with playing in other bands. Um, but there was a point where, you know, I, the more I sat down and played guitar, I, I kept getting these, you know, little song ideas in my head and, and I started kind of collecting them. And so, um, I think actually while I was in Oklahoma, I started kind of writing what I would call my first batch of real songs. And so I um, kind of had those stored away in my head. And um, there was a point where I felt like, you know, I need to get, I, I want to get these out there. So um, I started um, going to this open mic night in St. Louis called Chippewa Chapel. And um, that's kind of where I first started putting this all together for myself. And I was so nervous and I was, you know, but with, with the nervousness was also this just kind of creative, like, I have to do this, you know, I have to do this. And this is either, either going to work and lead to nowhere or, or it, it won't, you know, it'll, it'll turn into something. And so, um, sure enough, I started getting gigs around town. And um, then I got so busy with my solo project that I kind of then it was time for me to like, kind of say goodbye to all those other bands that I was in, because I felt like finally, I was like, okay, this is kind of the next phase. This is what I want to do. Got it. Yeah, I guess the phase at that point is either quit those bands, or charge them a lot more money. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to <laughs> one way to think about it. Yeah, so that's cool. So these days, when you have time set aside to write, if you do set aside time to write, uh, what does a typical creative day look like for you? Yeah, so um, I'm just going to approach that question by, uh, <laughs> well, I, I've been a very haphazard writer. Um, and I'm trying to be, especially the past year with the pandemic and everything, I'm trying to be more intentional about it. And um, that's always been a struggle for me. I feel like I write in spurts. Um, you know, I'll spend like maybe three or four months writing for an album and then um, won't really spend a lot of time on writing after that. But um, I've kind of... And I, and I would always feel bad about it. And, mm. and finally this year, I, I was like, why, why do I feel bad about this? This is just kind of how I work. I need to embrace that. And instead of seeing it as a something to feel bad about, just see it as, you know, this is me. This is where I'm at. And, and I want to be more intentional about it. So, um, so now I am trying to start this process where I'm recording like a demo a day kind of just in, in not a, not a finished thing, just trying to clear this, um, cache of like, you know, I probably have a hundred voice memos that I just need to be intentional about going through and, um, kind of working those out and see if they want to become songs or, if they're just gonna, you know, sit there. And so, uh, I guess what, what's helped me is every morning to try to just write, um, write for 30 minutes just to kind of clear my brain of things I might be, uh, worrying about things that I need to do. Just, just, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be necessarily creative writing, but just, just to write and, um, be intentional about that and kind of clear my mind for the day. And so that's, that's one thing I've been trying to be really intentional about. Um, it's really, I love what you just said there that some, some ideas, you know, you, you want to figure out if they want to become songs because I think yeah. a lot of songwriters just, we will recognize that feeling that uh, you'll have something. It looks like a song. It, it smells like a song. It walks like a song. It talks like a song, but, but <laughs> no matter how much you massage it or, or work with it or try different approaches with it, at the end of the day, it's just not a damn song. And you know that it's not. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm part of my process is, is been now like being okay with that. Mm -hmm. Just it's fine. It's, it's okay. If this thing, this little idea I had doesn't ever turn into a song, it's okay. (laughs) And so I think with my, with my creative process, I'm trying to, you know, get to, get to a point where I, I'm at peace with where I'm at and, um, and just trying to be more intentional about spending a little bit of time every day writing, even if it's um, like what I feel like has been working well for me is just taking like uh, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, like short snippets. Like I used to get so intimidated and what I would call this, like <laughs> have this perpetual anxiety of being a songwriter um, in that like, well, I have to spend like five hours today writing this song, you know, it, and that's not really true. That's a lot of pressure, you know, so I'm, I'm finding that if I can take just 15 minutes a couple times a day to, you know, try to uh, get this melody ironed out or get this lyric line ironed out, ironed out, like that's, that's a much better way f- for me to work. And I, and I feel like it kind of calms my anxious songwriter nerves yeah well and especially because songwriting in particular it does not you know the best songs do not necessarily correlate with how much time you spent on them it's not like if you're digging a ditch you know your 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 ability to dig the deepest ditch is really going to correlate with how much time you spend doing that but for me i i've spent hours and hours and hours working on songs that wouldn't become songs and then i've spent you know 25 minutes working on the songs of mine that people listen to the most. So, so there is no correlation or, or reason for guilt about not, you know, putting in hours upon hours on a particular song. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think for me, that's the, that's the thing I, I love and also hate about songwriting is that it, there's a fine line there, you know? Um, but when you kind of, even if you're just showing up 15, 20 minutes a day, it's like uh, I'm learning that that's that's the important thing. And um, to be, and this is me, I'm giving myself advice right now, Joe. <laughs> like <laughs> I'm listening. If, I'm all you know, I, I show up and, you know, there might be a day where I, I get a, a full song in 30 minutes, you know, but there might not be. And, and that's okay. The, the point is just to keep to keep trying and keep showing up because it's this um, unexplainable magical process sometimes. Have you noticed, um, has this new process paid any creative dividends for you so far? Have you noticed a change in your ability to, uh, to write more consistently, uh, better more consistently? Or, or have you noticed uh, that it just makes you feel good uh, to, to work in this way? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. Um, I have noticed, um, yeah, that I'm I'm able to actually make make a little more progress on some songs, and um, also I feel more relaxed about it. I I feel more I feel like the anxiety has lessened because it's it's kind of a- approaching it in less of an emotional way and more of a just systematic like yep, I'm going to very systematically work on these uh, voice memos. Like right. probably later today I'm going to go through, and I'm literally just going through them in order. I decided I can't have any emotional attachment to it, or I don't want to have right. emotional attachment to it right now. I'm just going to like, okay, number one, number two, number three, and just like literally go in chronological order and just you know put the time in and, and see if it goes anywhere. I really do. And so that's been, no, yeah, that's ahead. been re- relaxing and anxiety calming for me to approach it in that way. I know exactly what you mean. When you're not writing on a regular basis, when you finally do get that time to write, you feel like, all right, well, here we go. I got to write free falling right now or else I'm a fucking <laughs> fraud. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, I I felt, um, I mean, it was like two months into the pandemic and I know everybody was like cooped up and just had a lot of free time. And so I started seeing people like be like, 
putting out albums on Bandcamp or whatever that was just like, oh yeah, this I I wrote and recorded this album in two months, and I was just like. I felt really, b- I was like, am I a, f- a failure as a songwriter? Because I didn't write a quarantine album. Like, what the yeah. heck's going on? Um, but yeah, just alleviating yourself of that pressure is really helpful. Well, and the other helpful thing is for a lot of that stuff to go listen to it. And you're like, oh, actually, this album that they wrote and recorded in two months is trash. So... Um, <laughs> uh, not always, but, yeah. but sometimes. You know, I was like, man, what have I, I haven't, I haven't been writing at all. What have I been doing? Well, uh, what I had been doing actually was, uh, just figuring out how to keep getting music in front of people. So digging into the live stream thing. Yeah. Yeah. How, um, uh, how have you found that to be? Cause I've been doing the same exact thing and I've found it speaking personally, what I can't believe is that I wasn't doing this before the pandemic because I think it's such a great way to connect with people. Oh, man. Yeah, I feel the exact same way about that. Um, I feel like there, there's, you know, there's a tech learning curve to it all. Yeah. And I feel like this was a situation where, like, we didn't have to do it before. Right. But then we were put in a situation where it's like, well, that's the only way to connect with people. We got to figure this out. And, um, yeah, it's been so rewarding to, um, to see kind of a little community grow up around that. And, and everybody's like, I'm sure in your case, they're like, yeah, I'm always looking forward to Sundays and mine is every Monday night. So everybody's like, yeah, Monday, best night of the week. (laughs) Right on. And, uh, what time is it and where can people find that? Um, it's, uh, every Monday night at 8 PM central and it's streaming on Facebook and on YouTube. Right on. Yeah. I've, um, again, I, I just really feel like it was insane that I wasn't doing this before the pandemic. And what I'm hoping is a lot of people, um, a lot of musicians after the pandemic will stop doing live streams, uh, so that the market is less glutted. Cause I'm just going to continue doing yeah. this going forward. I, I really think that this is not something that's going to replace live touring, of course, but I think it's definitely going to augment um, how we connect with people. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that you're very uh, wise to see that kind of bigger picture because, yeah, it, it, it won't replace touring, but it it does add this other element that we didn't have before that I think is just um, so enriching to um, you and I as songwriters performers but also to people out there who just are hungry for music right and i don't know if you found this a ton but you know when you or i will go out on the road in non-covid times and tour you go out and you hit you know your bigger cities like chicago you know new york la and then you hit cities below that like indianapolis maybe a des moines this that and the other there's a lot of people that live in towns that are much smaller than that that we're never going to be able to tour to on a regular basis those people seem to really be taking advantage uh, of these live streams yeah yeah absolutely they're they they're not getting uh, they're not slipping through the cracks anymore Exa- they've got a way to connect no, it's it's really been a blessing. If this pandemic had happened even four or five years ago, I, I don't even think that the technology to stream uh, at this, you know, w- with the sort of video and audio quality that we can do now, I, I don't even think that that existed four or five years ago. We, we would have been kind of screwed. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Man, what a time. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, yeah. to be on your show and, and, and I can't wait to um, uh, have a beer with you and Kit next time I'm through St. Louis or the next time you guys are through DC to play alright yeah can't wait thank you so much Joe This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. 
Beth Bombara's latest album is entitled Evergreen, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. She also hosts a live stream every Monday night on YouTube at 8 p.m. Central. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.